The Holy Gospel according to St. John, the 20th chapter. Glory to you, o Lord. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, O Christ. Uh, some of you may know that before I came to St. Mark and returned back to the Midwest, Naomi and I lived out in the, uh, the state of Washington for 13 years. That's her home area. And we served, uh, like I said, a few congregations there. And it was uh, an early part of our ministry that was very significant in our getting started. But one of the things that was really shocking to me, coming from southern Minnesota, a rural area, much like this area, in fact, uh, was that out in Washington State, you have perhaps 2% of the population that belongs to a church. And so in our neighborhood, we discovered that hardly anyone knew about church or attended a church or had anything to do with the church and its mission. So we had a lot of opportunity to invite people to come to church because, again, the majority of the culture were doing other things on Sunday mornings uh, other than going to church. It was interesting to come back to the Midwest after 13 years and, again, to feel the, uh, the spirit of homogeny, if you will, here in uh, this part of the country where, again, there are churches everywhere. And the old joke was, you know, in these small towns and downtowns, you can find a church on every corner. That's kind of true, isn't it? But it's not that way out in the West or in other parts of the world. But we have a lot of churches here, a lot of Lutheran churches, and some would say we have uh, about as many Lutheran colleges as well. The college I attended in, in uh, Moorhead, Minnesota, up by Fargo there, yeah, sure, was uh, Concordia College. And Concordia College consisted of people like John Yulvasaker, you know, the good Norwegians up there in the northern Minnesota, and North Dakota, and Montana, and some South Dakota. We didn't have a lot of people there from Illinois or from Iowa, they tended to migrate other places. But a lot of Lutherans, a lot of Scandahuvians up there. Now, there were a few non-Lutherans, non-Europeans uh, that would attend. They were also there for different reasons. In fact, I began my junior year dating one of those non-Lutherans. Now, don't tell Naomi about this, okay? <laughs> keep this between you and me. <laughs> I started dating one of those non-Lutherans whose name was Luann. And uh, I was really kind of uh, taken back that she had never been to church before. But as I got to know her and her family a little bit, uh, I began to understand what was going on. In fact, I never met all of her family because she had 14 brothers and sisters. They had never gone to church as a family together because they didn't have enough cars. They needed a bus or something like that to get around. But, so when she came to school, it wasn't because Concordia was this great Lutheran school, the reason I came. She came because of the program in social work that she was uh, interested in. Well, we began dating, and it was, a, it was a brief period of dating. But in that time I got to know her, I was really concerned that she had not been a member of any church. She didn't know much about church at all. So we'd go to chapel, and, and we would talk about it, and all this was new to her. It was a mystery. And I really wanted to introduce Christ into her life. I really wanted her to understand the joy that so many of us have in being a part of the church. And so we began to attend worship together. We talked about the faith. She, began more, she became more and more curious and interested. And finally, and this was just a high mark uh, of those years for me, she said to me, Mark, I want to be baptized. How do I do that? And we were attending Lutheran Church of the Good Shepherd in Moorhead, and I talked with the pastor, and so one morning she was uh, in church and she was baptized and it was just a high point in my life. And I have to tell you that uh, years later I was reading one of my uh, college uh, books that they send out, you know, the magazines telling you. And you, of course if you get those you go back, you look to see who's had babies, who got married and who has passed away. You look at those things. 
And I saw that Luann had gotten married, and in fact, she and her husband were attending a seminary down in Texas preparing for missionary work. Again, I just couldn't be more excited for Luann and her life. Truly, God had been present, not only in our brief relationship, but in the seeds, I would call them the seeds of Pentecost, that allowed her to uh, be open to Christ in her life, to receive the gift of baptism, and then answer that call to ministry with her husband, uh, I would only assume it was overseas. It was a wonderful time in her life and in ours. That's something I think that is maybe foreign to many of us who grew up in the church. We would call many of us here cradle Lutherans. We were born amongst a family that, that already belonged to a church, maybe here at St. Mark. Some of you I know have been at St. Mark a very long time, or maybe some other church you've transferred here. But you've been a part of the church your whole life. And you've done things with other people in the church, maybe not Lutheran, but some church, or with other Christians. In other words, the faith community is a strong and long-lasting part of your life. Let me just have you raise your hands if you consider yourself a cradle Lutheran from your childhood on. How many of you? Again, that consists of most of us. But in the Northwest, again, in our neighborhoods, hardly any hands would go up at all. Pentecost, I think, this day is all about the most important announcement of all. And that is this community of faith, Christ Church, is indeed open to every human being. Where else in our life and our culture do we have that kind of invitation? We're so used to being told that you have to be this kind of person or that kind of person or have this background, such and such, before you can join or belong, but not the church. Jesus has made it possible through his death and resurrection and ascension and the sending of his spirit on Pentecost to announce that grand announcement that we are all loved and welcome here in God's church with God's people. Like those days of college where it was my privilege to sow some seeds of Pentecost, the announcement again today is given to each of us. Because we too can be seed sowers. And we never know where those seeds are going to sprout and grow because God does that work in the Spirit. But God invites us to plant those seeds and stand back and let God do God's work. But how do we go about doing that? I have to tell you, it's not about your preparation as much as your attitude. It's not about having all these credentials. It's about having an open mind an open spirit, if you will, so that the spirit of Christ can open your eyes, your ears, and most of all, I think, your attentiveness every day to the marvelous opportunities God is putting right in front of us that we have nothing to do with. We just need to be open, again, to the spirit of Christ, the spirit of Pentecost. But how do we define our outreach? How do we understand our mission on behalf of Jesus. A lot of times we get bogged down because we think there's so much we have to prepare for. But let me just share a story, one that has been so powerful in my life, from Luke chapter 7, where a woman barges in to a place where Jesus is having dinner and touches Jesus' feet. She destroys all the social norms of her day, and yet Jesus praises her and lifts her up. Let me share a little bit about that story, a summary. The story takes place in the home of a Pharisee, Simon. Now, Simon no doubt had been watching and listening to Jesus for some time, and as Pharisees go, they were curious about Jesus' teachings. We know that later on they became irate and determined to rid Jesus of themselves, but at this point, there's still some conversation going on. And so he invites Rabbi Jesus into his home for dinner. And you can imagine the just the amazing, bizarre turn of events, has this woman who has a very public reputation as being a, quote, sinful woman, whatever that means, bursts into the scene, and she lets down her hair on Jesus' legs and feet. She is crying, and so she cleans his feet with her tears and then dries them with her hair. She interrupts this discourse between Simon and Jesus, probably on theology or scripture or some of his teaching, who knows what, and she comes in with an agenda, not of explanation, not of verification, 
a simple act of love on behalf of Jesus. Now Simon is getting very irate at this point because, again, this was a men's group, if you will. That's how it was back then. And women stayed out of those conversations. So she breaks, again, the rules on several levels. But again, she comes in and does what is so unexpected. And Simon, if you can imagine, if someone crashes your party and takes over, he's really upset. And he thinks to himself, he says, if this man were indeed a prophet, he would know what kind of woman this is. And somehow Jesus, either hearing him speak under his breath or anticipating what he's thinking, says, you know, Simon, when I first came here, you did not wash my feet. You did not welcome me in the way she did. You offered me none of this. She, on the other hand, has been utterly extravagant in welcoming me. And then he asked Simon this very pointed question. It is a loaded question. And he says, Simon, stop whatever you're thinking and doing. Do you see this woman? If we unpack that a bit, I think what Jesus is really asking is, Simon, can you acknowledge her? Can you value what she is doing? Simon, can you welcome her? And perhaps even more incredible, Simon, can you love her? So oftentimes, we are Simon. We see people around us in our culture, and we consider them to be the outsiders, the people who have no place around us, no place in our well-defined and proper way of thinking and reacting and living. These are the outsiders in our life who deserve what they get, right? We see ourselves, unfortunately at times, as being insiders with Jesus, because we know what's expected of people of faith. And yet God and Christ and the Holy Spirit on Pentecost utterly barge into all of that and ask of us, do you see these people in your lives with whom you bump into, the people you associate with, the people you ignore or avoid altogether? So oftentimes, the most difficult thing for established churches, those who have been around a long time, they get very comfortable, very used to things. And it's so hard when we get together to see anyone other than the people we are comfortable with or the people we enjoy. And so with those blinders on, we don't see a lot of the people who are indeed among us. And not just in worship, but in our, our work, our other places of life outside, within the community. We're just so used to going our routine patterns and ways that when the Spirit knocks and says, here's your opportunity, we miss it. Many years ago, again out in Washington State, I served in a congregation that was very, very conflicted. I didn't know that when I accepted the call. And lo and behold, I discovered that much of what they told me about themselves in my interviews and all that, they painted a rosy picture that they were a loving congregation that got along just great. And indeed, they had a lot of good things going for them. I was excited for them. But I learned from the very first council meeting that these were a people in conflict with each other. We had long council meetings. We had all kinds of discussions about, about how to run church, how to be church, who was welcome, who wasn't. And the first thing agenda they had was to get along. But they couldn't do it. There were these little turf wars going on. They were fighting among themselves, trying to get their own way. It was not good. And so we often had long council meetings. I remember one council meeting, it started at 7, and it didn't finish till midnight. It was awful. And we still didn't finish our work. We eventually 
were able to understand how destructive that behavior was among our leadership and our people. But it was hard to recruit people, if you can understand, to be in council and do those kinds of things. We recruited a young man by the name of Matt. And Matt uh, came, and, and, and this was all new to him. He had never been to church before, and he was a great guy, and lo he looked like a great uh, person to have on council, so he was invited. And at his first meeting, I'll, I'll never forget, he just kind of sat there wide-eyed as all this conversation was going on, and finally someone said, Matt, you're new here. What's your impression of what's going on? And Matt just sat there for a second, and he was absolutely quiet, and finally he said, well, I, I have to agree with you that there are lots of challenges at this church. He said, but I don't think I'm the right person to offer an assessment. You see, I've spent 30 plus years outside the church before anyone here ever invited me to come. And once you received me as a member here, I was ecstatic. It was wonderful. And then he said, I'm just so glad to be among so many people who love the Lord so much and enjoy serving this church. It seemed like an eternity, the period of silence that followed. But that was a turning point for our council and for our church. Because Matt had just reminded us what a treasure it is to be able to welcome Jesus and to serve those to whom he calls. Let me ask you that question one more time. Simon? Do you see this woman? Do you acknowledge her? Will you value her? Can you welcome her? And will you love her? You see, herein lies our Pentecost challenge. Will we notice the people day in and day out that God puts before, before us with a spirit of welcome, a spirit of acceptance, a spirit of love? Will we look past all the cultural barriers that we still hold up and value so deeply? By the power of God's love, can we move beyond it? When it comes to welcoming Jesus into our hearts, we cannot continue to be constrained or calculating in deciding who we are going to welcome. Jesus deserves our extravagant hospitality, and so does every single person for whom he lives and dies. May the spirit of Pentecost this day fill us with the spirit of Jesus. Let us pray. Lord, on this day of Pentecost, you again awaken us to the vitality of your message, the urgency of the gospel, and the work you have set before each of us. Lord, forgive us when we become complacent and comfortable, when we assign the work of evangelism to other people. Lord, give us the spirit of opportunity, the spirit of acceptance, that when you nudge us, to act on your behalf in love, that we would have the courage, the boldness, the desire to welcome them on your behalf. Bless us in our consideration, in our discernment, and in our attentiveness to the people you give us each day. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.